Man Performance USA, the greatest entertainers in America, as requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command Performance! Presented this week and every week till it's over, over there. It's command performance time in the USA, and the big guns of the American entertainment world are set to fire another half-hour salvo of music, comedy, and sport, as requested by you fighting soldiers, sailors, and Marines. Tonight's first letter is from Private Bill W., down in the Caribbean, who says, Dear command performance, I got it all figured out that the next time our big show pops in here, I'll be doing KP duty. But don't worry. Because I can peel spuds and listen to Kate Smith at the same time. Get it, buddy? We want Kate Smith. Well, that's all it takes, Private Bill. So grab another spud and sit back and listen, because here she is, Kate Smith. Greetings to you, buddies. What do you say? What's new? What'll it be tonight, boys? You're the GHQ... You up there in the flying fortress, high in the stratosphere. You with the jeep, or the briny deep. What would you like to hear? What would it be, Ned Leatherneck, out there stalking our foes? This is a command performance, and whatever you say, goes. And now for Private Bill down in Caribbean, Kate Smith sings, How About You? I like New York in June. How about you? I like a Gershwin tune. How about you? I like a fire high when a storm is due. I like potato chips, moonlight motor trips. How about you? I'm mad about good books. Can't get my fill. And Franklin Roosevelt Blue, they sure give me a thrill. Holding in the movie show when all the lights are low may not be new but I like it how about you My fill and Franklin Roosevelt Blue, they sure give me a thrill. Holding hands in the movie show when all the lights are low may not be new, but I like it. How about you? Here's a letter from a Cincinnati boy in the Air Corps who has this to say. What's happened to Henny Youngman? Tall, dark, and crazier than a flock of loons. He nearly killed me in a movie short called Love in Gloom. If you're taking orders from a grease monkey, then this grease monkey says, let Henny Youngman run wild. Okay, buddy. Henny Youngman is opening this week at Lowe State Theater here in New York City. And when he got your letter, he yelled, when do we start? So here he is, Henny Youngman. Thank you, and I want to thank the boys in the Air Corps for asking for me. Naturally, they all know me. Flew my own plane for two years, then a rubber band broke. <laughs> By the way, I want to apologize for being late. Boy, did I have a busy day today. I've been down to the Red Cross. You know, I offered them a pint of my blood. They looked at me and they talked me into taking a pint of theirs. <laughs> Fine doctors they got down there, wise guys. The one that examined me for blood worked on me for three hours. First he used a stethoscope, then a fluoroscope, then a microscope. Finally he said, okay, young man, we give up. Where'd you hide it? <laughs> I said, come on, come on, fellas. Now cut the clowning out. I want to see the head doctor. Just then he walked in. I said, hey, doc. What do you have to do around here to donate a pint of blood? He said, wait a minute, I'll examine you personally. And what an examination. Right after it, he slapped me in the face. I said, what's the idea, Doc? 
He said, when we want hot water, we'll send for you. <laughs> that isn't all that happened. On the way down here, I bent over to pick up a dime. Some guy jacked me up and stole my rubber heels. <laughs> not that I care, mind you, not that I care. You're looking at a man who owns a tire outright. <laughs> Incidentally, if any of you ladies want to come up to my room to see my tires, lady, you're welcome. Talking about ladies, there's two kinds of women, the pretty ones and the ones I get. I was out with a girl last night so ugly when she ordered a tongue sandwich, the tongue went... <laughs> Brother, was she ugly. She was a professional blind date. <laughs> she looked like tobacco road on a wet night. <laughs> Four drunks looked at her, they took the pledge. Of course, the place for beautiful women is Hollywood. I just got back from there, you know. I was in one picture with Mr. Charles Lawton called the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I wasn't exactly in the picture. I was the guy they shoved up Lawton's back. <laughs> Must have been pretty good. People recognized me. One woman walked up to me and she said, you know, I saw your picture four times yesterday. I said, why, did you like it so much? She said, no, I couldn't find my shoes. <laughs> but after all, folks, there's no place like New York. I went to see the fights the other night at Madison Square Garden. Ted Collins got me seats. You know, he has connections. From where I sat, the fight was only a rumor. <laughs> I was up so high, I was getting spirit messages. <laughs> so yes, he got me halfway up the stairs. He said, you'll have to go the rest of the way by yourself. From here on, my nose starts to bleed. I was the only guy in my row without a harp. <laughs> I said to the man next to me, how do you like the fight? He said, what fight? I'm flying the mail to Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, 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 it was very nice of you men to ask for me. But I got to go now, fellas. My wife is waiting for me. Today I taught her how to drive a car. Tomorrow she learns how to aim it. <laughs> Good night. Thank you very much, Henny Youngman. Dear Command Performance, says our next order of the evening, Hetty Lamar and Ann Sheridan may be topped with the majority of this man's army, but the voice I'm anxious to hear answers to the name of Queenie. She may not be a sweater girl, but she's the only female I ever knew who didn't give me any trouble. I'd be mighty grateful if I could just hear her speak. Well, Private MJS, thanks to a couple of Columbia Network sound engineers and their recording apparatus, here is your Queenie's voice. <laughs> and there you have it, Private MJS, the voice of Queenie, the girl you left behind you. And now, in response to the command of a yeoman somewhere in the South Pacific, the popular MC of the famous hit parade sings, There's Gonna Be a Great Day. All right, come on, Barry Wood, and let's hear it. When skies were dark, came Noah's Ark on men. When lions roared, came Daniel's Lord on men. Now, Lord, help those who pray, and on judgment day, if you believe, he shall receive you all, then, when you're down and out, hold up your head and shout, there's gonna be a great day, those angels in the sky promise that by and by, there's gonna be a great day. Gabriel will warn you some early morn You will hear his horn Rudy Tootin is not far away Hold up your hands and say There's gonna be a great day Gabriel will warn you some early morn You will hear his horn It's not far away Hold up your hands and say there's gonna be a great day. Thank you, 
Thank you very much, Barry Wood. And now, what's our next letter, Ted? It's from a Marine down in the Canal Zone, Catherine, and he's wondering whether any new comedians have been developed in radio this season. Well, that question is best answered by saying, here he is, the star of Duffy's Tavern in his famous characterization of Archie, Ed Gardner. Oh, well, I didn't think I was going to get away tonight after talking on the phone to Duffy. Mad in the hornet's nest tonight, you know. About the ball team. He can't find a guy to replace two top crush in us. Two had a pitcher, you know. A pitcher with two heads? Pitcher with two heads, yeah. Why? The fella actually has two heads? Yeah, two heads. This, this thing will tell you what a genius Duffy is as a manager. So, Mr. Collins, you see? Says that Dugan, the shortstop one day, says, uh, Dugan, we got a great ball team here, but I'm afraid it lacks color. What's the answer? So uh, Dugan says, color, huh? Well, this may not be it, Duffy, but I think I know where I can lay my hands on a pitcher with two heads. So Duffy says, a pitcher with two heads, huh? I don't know, Finnegan, you think it'd be a novelty? Uh, so Finnegan says, well, what if it ain't? You can't pass up a pitcher that can watch first base and third base at the same time. <laughs> so Duffy says, yeah, it's an angle. Uh, what's the guy's name? So uh, Finnegan says, well, his name is McGinnis. Uh, Athos and Porthos, McGinnis. <laughs> However, he's called Two Top Gruskin for short. I suppose on account of him having two heads. Yeah. Archie, did you actually see this two-headed pitcher yourself? Certainly I seen him. I remember the night he first walked into Duffy's town and dressed up formal in a tuxedo to sign his contract. Everybody in the joint stared at the guy. So the two cops turned his two heads to the crowd and he says, What are you staring at? None of you guys ever see a tuxedo before? <laughs> well, <laughs> Duffy quick covers the embarrassment, of course. He says, Way to bring two beers for this gentleman. So then he turns to Two Top and he says, uh, Two Top, I'm a man of few words. Report tomorrow morning. There's a uniform and two caps waiting for you in the locker room. Uh, how did Two Top get along with the ball team? Well, not quite as well as you'd naturally expect. You see, we had a catcher, Gorilla Hogan. Great guy, so natural born catcher. Stood uh, six feet, 14 inches high. And he squats, standing up. A real bemihot, you know. <clears throat> Looks like he just stepped out of a jungle. Sounds to me like a monstrosity. Yes, well, fella. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, yes. the trouble starts right off in the first game. You see, the gorilla signals for a fast curve, so the two-headed guy nods one head, and he... Well, this is very confusing to the gorilla. You see, he ain't such a bright guy anyway. So he throws down his glove, and he walks to Duffy. So Duffy says, now, don't get excited, Gorilla. Go out there and talk it over with the guy. After all, three heads is better than one. <laughs> but the Gorilla says, no, nope, Duffy, it's no use. I just got a feeling that the guy ain't quite normal. <laughs> one of us don't have to go, Duffy, and don't forget who owns the baseball. <laughs> so Duffy had a fire two top, you know, and it was sad the way the lump came up in his throat when... <laughs> When Duffy told him he had to go. Uh, what's he doing now? Uh, what's he doing? He's in the Army. Uh, in uh, the Army? But didn't he have trouble getting in? Uh, well, a little trouble. He was a little too short. <laughs> but they finally passed him. You see, the doctor examined him and took the report to the colonel. So, funny thing, they kind of looked at the card and he says, let me see here. Uh, two top Gruskin. Eyes, black and blue. <laughs> Hair, blonde and brunette. <laughs> Teeth, all and none. <laughs> Mustache, yes and no. So the colonel says, this guy sounds like he's got two heads. So the doctor says, yeah. So the colonel says, oh. So they took him in. <laughs> well, now tell me, didn't the two heads handicap him in the army? Uh, well, yeah, saluting was a bit of a problem for him, uh, you know, left hand and all. But the main trouble was that the one head couldn't get no sweep. You see, they made the other head the bugler. Well, 
I gather that he wasn't very happy in the army, huh? Well, he wasn't entirely unhappy. You know, a lot of guys in the army are lonely, but the guy like Two Top always has each other. <laughs> and the uh, two heads helped him in a lot of spots, you know. He was the only guy in the regiment could do eyes right and about face at the same time. You know? <laughs> And the two heads came in handy for publicity in the Army. They used his picture from the neck up. Uh, you know, the V for victory. <laughs> of course, the big advantage was on payday every month. He'd walk by the paymaster's window and draw $42. <laughs> Tell me, how does the Army feed a guy like that? Well, if they don't, he can always quit and go back to his old job. And what was that? Watching tennis matches for Pat Day News. Thank you, Ed Gardner. And now, boys, I want you to listen to this letter from a soldier. And I mean a real soldier. I can't tell you where he is, but he's doing his bit under a certain general whose name starts out with M-A-C. I fought in the last war, he says. And there was a song then that meant an awful lot to me. I'd like to hear it again now. How's about somebody singing a chorus of Keep the Home Fires Burning? Well, brothers, here is your song, sung by the entire studio audience right here in the theater tonight. Keep the Home Fires Burning. <laughs> Somewhere in the far north, we bring you the latest developments in the American sporting scene described by that ace of sports commentators, Ted Husing. Hello there, fellows. Here's a summary of the sports news for the present time. In baseball, all the clubs are hard at work conditioning themselves for the coming campaign. The Yankees are so strong, they're again considered the ultimate champions for this year. Over in the National League, the Dodgers have been strengthened by the purchase of Archie Vaughn, and that practically hands the pennant to the boys from Daffyville. You know, men, that the president has just announced that he's in favor of continuing sports, particularly baseball, as a wartime recreational effort. And in the exhibition games played to date, it's rather amazing that all the clubs are showing mid-season form at bat and the field. In boxing, Joe Lewis, who will meet Abe Simon at the end of the month and donate his entire purse to the Army Emergency Relief Fund, continues to prove that he is more than a fighting champion. He has endeared himself to all sport fans by his fight with Buddy Bear for the Navy Relief Fund and by his conduct in the Army. Jimmy Walker said of Joe, he laid a rose on Lincoln's grave. And Joe himself spoke a simple speech at the Garden the other night that made the fans stand up and yell back in applause. You know, nothing else in boxing matters, fellas, but Joe Lewis. In track and field, Dutch Warmadam continues his amazing sky-high pole vaulting, and right now, at this moment, in San Francisco, he's attempting to clear 16 feet. Greg Rice and Les McMitchell continue their hold on the two-and-one-mile running championship, but Gilbert Dodds, a newcomer to the big time, is making it hot for both of them, and is the greatest sensation of the year. In horse racing, Al Sab, last year's two-year-old champion, has been lacking in speed as a three-year-old this year, and when the Kentucky Derby comes around in May, some little-known nag is liable to take the run for the roses all for himself. In the $50,000 widener a week ago, not one named horse of the 17 that raced finished in the money. And incidentally, bad news. Eddie Arcaro broke his arm today in a spill at Florida Tropical Park. In golf, Lloyd Mangrum, Chick Harbert, and one or two of the others not so well-known are stepping on the toes of the famous headliners while stomping through the winter circuit. The Masters Tournament will be held in Augusta in April, and Craig Wood, who has dominated each renewal since it began in 1934, 
should come back out on top again. And that's all the scoreboard shows. So long, fellas. Thanks, Ted Husing. Thank you very much. And now just listen to this letter, fellas, and hold on to your hat. It says, Dear Command Performance, I'm a lieutenant in the Army, but I'm not a fighting man. Actually, I use lipstick, and I even tint my fingernails and pluck my eyebrows. But don't be alarmed, because I'm a nurse in the United States Army. Army nurses are usually carrying out the doctor's orders, but here's one time the nurse prescribed, and the prescription, Robert Benchley. Well, little lady, here's your wish right now. Here he is, Robert Benchley. Thank you, Miss Smith. This is a speech that I'm prepared to deliver tomorrow to a group of sailors at one of the naval training stations. Sailors. I would bring you a message, a message of warning, and yet at the same time, a message of good cheer. You are about to venture out into the world, and it's high time that you learn something about the facts of life. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I hardly know how to begin. Uh, <laughs> perhaps dear Harry would be as good a way as any. <laughs> dear Harry. You have all doubtless seen during your walks in the country how the butterflies and bees carry pollen from one flower to another. <laughs> it is very dull. <laughs> you should be very glad that you're not a bee or a butterfly. You know, someday a bee is going to get hold of a real book on this subject, and from then on there'll be mighty little pollen toting done. <laughs> I know my bees at all. Anyway, if you notice carefully how the bees carry pollen from one flower to another, you will have wondered what connection there is between this process and that of animal reproduction. Well, I may as well tell you right now that there is no connection at all. <laughs> So your whole morning of bee stalking has been wasted. For a more practical illustration of the facts of life, let's consider hen's eggs. If you will look at these eggs, you will see that each one is almost round, but not quite. They're more of an egg shape. <laughs> now, this is nature's way of distinguishing eggs from large golf balls. <laughs> See, Mother Nature takes no chances. Remember that. That's a lesson that all of you could learn. The egg, if I may say so, is not the only thing that had something to do with a hen. Now, the rooster is an entirely different <laughs> kind of bird. The rooster is very proud and has a red crest on the top of his head. This red crest is put there by nature so that the hen can see the rooster coming in a crowd and can hop into a taxi or make a previous engagement. <laughs> if she wants to, I don't... Know. But before we take up this phase of the question, for it is a question, let's go back to the fish kingdom. Fish are probably the worst examples you can find. In the first place, because they work underwater. <laughs> and in the second, because they don't know anything. You won't find a fish in a million that has enough sense to come in out of the rain. <laughs> now, the only way a fish can go wrong is through drink or stealing. This makes the fish's life highly unattractive. The, after a time, we get very tired of drinking and stealing, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, we've now covered the various agencies of nature for populating the Earth with the lesser forms of life. We've purposely omitted any reference to the reproduction of those unicellular organisms which reproduce by dividing themselves up into two, four, eight, and so forth, parts without any outside assistance at all. This method is too silly to discuss. <laughs> we now come to colors. You all know that if you mix yellow with blue, you get green. You also get green if you mix cherries and milk, you know. <laughs> I had to put that in. 
The derivation of one color from the mixture of two other colors is not generally considered a biological phenomenon, but it's because the psychoanalysts haven't got around to it yet. By next season, it won't be safe to admit that you like to paint even. Enough. People will begin to wonder about you. All of which brings us to the point of wondering if the facts of life are not all a gigantic hoax. A scientist has already come out with the announcement that, that there is no such thing as 100% male or 100% female. If this is true, it's going to throw a lot of people out of work. <laughs> uh, I think this just about covers all there is to be said on the subject, or all that we're allowed to say on the subject. <laughs> But uh, if there are any questions, or even any answers that you want to put to me, I will be in the lobby after the rally, or the rally after the lobby, uh, and you just try and stump me. Shall we? Thank you very much. Robert Bensley, that was fine. And now for a certain private first class located somewhere in the land of the Blarney Stone, a song as Irish as Patty's Pig and 50 times as beautiful. Rose O'Day. Johnny McCarthy loved Rosie O'Day. She was the prettiest thing. And every night in his sweet Irish under her window he'd sing Rose a day, Rose a day You're my filly dooky chin of marusha ball around a poop tootie Rose a day, Rose a day You're my filly dooky chin of marusha ball around a poop tootie You're daring, you're darling, you're lovely That's what I mean when I say Rose a day, Rose a day you're my filigadoochie, chinnam a roochie, bald around the boom tooty, boom tooty, boom tooty, boom tooty, yeah. You're my filigadoochie, chinnam a roochie, bald around the boom tooty, yeah. You're my filigadoochie, chinnam a roochie, bald around the boom tooty, yeah. You're daring, you're darling, you're lovely. A little colored boy down south buried his face in a big piece of Georgia watermelon. A half hour later, he looked up sadly and said, That's all it is. They ain't no more. Well, we feel the same way about this half hour. Thanks an awful lot for listening. And now this is Kate Smith wishing each and every one of you the best of the best. And saying on behalf of all of us on command performance, God bless you from over here. Our hearts are with you over there. Good night, boys. <laughs> Command Performance USA is broadcast every week at this same time to the fighting men in Uncle Sam's armed forces. It's your show, men, tailor-made to your request for entertainment from home. Let us know what you'd like to hear, and we'll produce it. For this is the American entertainment industry's own tribute to you, the men at the front. Address your request to Command Performance USA in care of the station to which you are listening. So long, buddy. <laughs>